For four generations now, my family has lived on this land. The water I drank came from under this ground. The food I ate was grown in this soil. The oxygen that kept me alive was provided by these trees, this grass. I grew up with these hills as constant companions. They were always there in the background as we gardened, put up hay, had family reunions, celebrated life's joys and sorrows. No one ever took pictures of these hills as a specific subject. They were always just there, as they had been for millions of years. It wasn't until I was in my early 30s that I realized that wasn't something I could take for granted. My friend Larry Gibson found this out the hard way. In 1986, Massey Energy began building a mountaintop removal mine near his family home, a place the Gibsons had inhabited for 200 years. Over the next 25 years, Larry watched as the mountains surrounding him were blasted to rubble and pushed into the adjoining valleys, destroying the very landscape that had fed his eyes, stomach, lungs, and soul from childhood. Mountaintop removal mining is a cost-efficient method of mining coal that involves the following steps. Cutting all timber on a designated site. Often the timber is simply burned or pushed into the adjoining valley. Setting explosives into the mountain and blasting away everything covering up the coal seam. An estimated 3 million pounds of explosives are used daily in West Virginia alone for this purpose. Use of two-story tall machines called drag lines to remove the blasted bits of mountain, now euphemistically called overburden. Disposal of this overburden in the adjoining valley, filling in waterways and burying everything under tons of rubble. An estimated 750 miles of stream have been buried in West Virginia alone. Removal of the exposed coal seams by a drag line and truck. Reclamation of the site often using non-native plants and grasses chosen specifically for their ability to grow in the rubble left behind. Larry Gibson has not gone quietly. He has been arrested. He's spoken out, written letters, joined protests, met celebrities, given interviews, and hosted countless groups of people on his property, which is now surrounded by a wasteland of bare rock and rubble. I visited Larry's home, Cayford Mountain, with my father, then 75, and three close friends. Together, we followed Larry up the path through the woods to the edge of the site. As far as I could see in the distance was a landscape that I can only compare to pictures I've seen of the faces of other planets, one devoid of any plant or animal life, water source, or discernible feature. It tore at my guts. It made my heart ache, and tears came to my eyes. As I watch my state being torn apart by the debate that rages around this practice, 
As neighbor once again turns against neighbor, I wonder. I wonder how we as a nation will confront the ever-expanding demand for energy. How will we as a state deal with the consequences of those decisions? What is the answer? As I look to the future, everything is uncertain. Everything except that sick feeling I got in my stomach as I looked at what they'd done to Kayford Mountain. The musician Steve Earle says, you can't always believe your eyes. It's your heart that sees through all the lies. There has to be a better way. There just has to. We've got about, what, 22 minutes to talk about this issue, and I have on my right Laura Stevens, who's with the Beyond, Beyond Coal Campaign uh, with uh, Sierra Club here in Oregon, and that's probably a national as well. Yeah, that's right, yep. And, yep. Then, and then you were brought along um, Carol Ross, who recently mm -hmm. was living in West Virginia, and is going to make a little personal testament to the mountaintop removal. And the mountaintop removal is bad enough, but what they do when they remove it is they dump it into the valleys. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But there's a, a move right now to, uh, Carol came out here to get away from all that, and, and we had come to find out there's a lot of things going on here Re locally with coal. We've had a couple of activists on the phone, on the program in the past, who were with the Sierra Club that talked about the closing down Boardman and different mm -hmm. and different uh, situations going on then. But that's been a couple of years, and, and Laura's going to bring us up a little bit to date with what's going on now. Great. Thanks so much for having us, you today, bet. I really you appreciate bet. it. Really appreciate it. it. It's an important issue, and um, we don't hear enough about it. I yeah, well, folks need to know that Big Coal has big plans for the area that they want to turn Oregon into a, whole, a hub for dirty coal export. Um, what, what basically has happened in the past year is um, coal companies, you know, Peabody, Arch Coal, you know, the big bad coal companies come in and propose to um, export coal from Montana and Wyoming, the Powder River Basin. Mm -hmm. Through, Where we get all of our coal. Right. The, one of the largest reserves of coal in the world. Um, you know, you know, larger than Biggest Appalachia. Biggest on the planet. Right. And it's the number one coal area. Even here in this in this area, in, I mean in, in in Montana and Wyoming, more so than back east. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Powder River Basin is the biggest. Yeah. And then oh, here oh your my hair is on the mic. It's beautiful as it is. It's, it's, <laughs> it's with getting with your, your microphone. Okay, now you can hear me more clearly. <laughs> um, so they want to export this coal through the Pacific Northwest and out to Asia, where demand for coal is rising. Of course, demand for coal in the U.S. is slowly decreasing because we've been working hard to get off of coal and here. And it hasn't been easy. <laughs> and it hasn't been easy, but we've made so much progress. In Oregon, in Washington, we have dates for our only and last coal plants to get off of coal. And now, Big Coal wants to come through and undermine all of that progress that they've made, that we've made. So they, there are six coal export terminals in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon and Washington that they've proposed. They would be, two of them would be the largest coal export terminals in North America. And um, three of them are in Oregon. So we have um, one proposal from Amber Energy, which is an Australian coal company that has a very dishonest track record. Uh, um, and a year ago, they had they um, retracted their permits for a, a five million ton coal export terminal in Longview. Um, to put that in perspective, Boardman, Oregon's coal plant, burns two to three million tons of coal per year. And so but how much was the so original? Five, five. So oh. it's larger, it's more than we burn in Oregon every year. But 
we found, um, our, our legal team found internal emails saying, um, don't tell anyone, but don't tell the community, don't, you know, because they, they'll be upset. But we actually <laughs> intend to export 25 to 60 million tons of coal per year. So there was a PR mess for them after that. And, um, and now they're back with 44 million tons of coal per year through Longview. Through Longview. Through Longview. Um, and then, so that same company, Amber Energy, has proposed to barge coal down the Columbia River, dirty coal. You know, we know that coal contains mercury, arsenic, and lead. Sulfur. Sulfur. Mm -hmm. Exposure to coal dust is linked to lung cancer and heart disease and asthma, um, diesel pollution from, um, Dozens, communities across the region would see dozens, if not you know, communities like Spokane and the Columbia River Gorge would see all of this train traffic. So dozens and dozens of coal trains uncovered. Uh, Carol has a really great picture of what this, this looks like in West Virginia. Last weekend, I don't know that it's... Oh, I'll hold it up and see if we can yeah. get something out of this here. Let I me mean, make sure I don't get it upside down here. This is they may be able to grab that on my fact, camera. In fact, this train is, go is export. This is going to Norfolk, Virginia, and out to Asia. Um, but you can see that it's the coal is piled high. They don't mm -hmm. care. And coal is falling all off. You can see along the bank, it's all coal there. So everywhere a coal train passes, you're going to have coal dust all over all the plants. You're going to have coal dust that skims on the water just like a slick of oil. They avoid the mitigation procedures you would use, which is wetting it down because it costs money, slows right. them down. I was, was going to ask that, why don't, you know, to, to avoid the controversy, why not just cover it up? Right. But well, the they cost do of it. cover the barges, but the trains, the, the cost would, would be so. Right. Plus, nobody's made them do it. And it's really interesting <laughs> That's because. That's what we're here to do. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Well, and the rail companies, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, passed a rule last October requiring coal companies to um, cover the coal trains. They're fighting about it in court still because nobody wants to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, but the coal dust is just the tip of the iceberg of problems associated with with you know mining, transporting, and burning coal. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course, coal mining is extremely devastating to the health, our health, and the environment. And Carol will get into that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but transporting coal, so communities in you know in Montana, Spokane. Columbia River Gorge, Portland, and Vancouver, um, the impacts that we would see locally would be coal dust, diesel pollution. So diesel pollution contains more 40 toxic oh. chemicals. It's, it's much dirtier than gasoline. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it requires a lot of diesel to move these very heavy trains. Um, they're noisy. They uh, bisect many communities. They're mile, a mile to a mile and a half long, so very long trains. So and slow. And slow. Ten and miles an hour. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so folks that live on the other side of the tracks, that means that emer you know emergency vehicle access is very much an issue. Um, commuting to work, and my commute to work was you have to wait, to, you know, wait. You come off of I five and have to wait there by OMSI for a train to pass. There's going to be a lot of them too. Yeah, obviously. yeah. And our and our rail infrastructure is a very valuable way for us to move goods, and we'd like to move more people on our rail system. Mm -hmm. um, and we should be dedicating it to you know productive, um, you know, progressive causes rather than clogging it up with coal trains. Um, other and, and this is all to bring coal to other countries. To other countries, correct. Um, the health impacts continue. We know that up to a fifth or more of the mercury pollution that we see here in the Willamette River, for example, comes from abroad. Mercury pollution. That's from coal plants abroad that are burning coal. That's circling the planet, mm -hmm. and the, the pollution. Atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. most of it comes acid from Asia. Rain. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, acid mm -hmm. rain is another issue. And climate change. Coal is the leading contributor to climate change. And, um, and the scale of these six coal export terminals of 150 million tons of coal burned per year um, 
It outweighs the climate impacts of the tar sands Keystone XL pipeline, which is enormous in itself. Which right. is enormous in itself. So we need to you know, we need to get stop all of these fossil fuel export projects, and we need to keep keep it in the ground. Um, and we have a responsibility here in the Pacific Northwest to make sure that that coal stays in the ground and does not get burned abroad. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the, yeah. this is the a front line in the in the battle to to save the planet. Then yes, it's, it's a little dramatic, but that's what's going it's, on. This is the yes. key. The Northwest is the key to it all, really. Yes. Yep. Yes, that, and and the, what are the five cities? Is Longview, Bellingham, yeah, Longview, Bellingham. So actually, I've got the map right here. If, if this is not too, it might be too small too here. Small but yeah, that's a little bit small. Okay. So so what you're talking about is Boardman, is, so now yeah. Coos Bay, St. Helens, which already okayed this. Yes. Is I understand. Of, yeah, the, and Longview too. The, no, not quite yet. They they did once, but then that when they okay. yeah then they had to retract it. So the port of St. Helens and the port of Morrow and Boardman, those local commissioners already approved this. So what we're seeing with um, the Columbia River dirty coal barging project is that now the state has two months to make a decision on whether they're going to allow Oregon and the Columbia River to become a conduit for dirty coal export. So or, two months. So it's Washington and Oregon both have to separately make this decision? No, it's Oregon. It's really, it's Oregon because both um, both terminals are on the Oregon side. So so the the state of Oregon is going to be making a decision about the Columbia River coal barging project. Oh, which, which terminals would that be, the two? It'd be, it'd be so, uh, well, Longview and St. Helens. Do, yeah, basically what they would do is they would ship coal by rail from the, from the Powder River Basin to Boardman and then they would transfer the coal to barges and barge it down the Columbia River to um, Klatskanai, to the to the Port Westward property in Klatskanai, Oregon. You know, it's about an hour and a half from Portland right. downriver. Um, and then transfer it to the big ocean going freighters right there. So that's, so So number one, we've got the coal barging project in Oregon um, on the Columbia River. We've got another rail proposal um, in, um, at, at, in Klatskanai at the port of St. Helens. So that would be a dozen coal trains coming through Portland every day. A dozen coal trains you coming through Portland every day, a mile to a mile and a mile half mile long, and a half. each one of them times 12. Um, then the port of Coos Bay is number three for Oregon. So again, those would be coal trains coming through Portland, um, then through southeast Portland and on to through Eugene and on to Coos Bay. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got the three in Washington, so Longview, Grays Harbor and Bellingham. All of this traffic would come through the Columbia River Gorge. And it would all go at least as far as Portland. And then, well, some of it would go on the Washington side through Vancouver. Right. So but it, but Portland and Vancouver see all of this. But it's still going down the river in between Portland and, and uh, Vancouver. So, it right. would have, so depending on the wind, it would affect us. For the for the barge project, so the barges right. they're saying this is Amber Energy again, you know the company that has a track record of lying. But Amber Energy is saying that they're, they're going to find a way to cover the barges to mitigate coal dust. Um, but the the rail proposals with mile and a half long coal trains would be coming straight through Portland. So the majority of it is coming through Portland in one way or the other. Right. And. Uh, right. This can be this can be cut off at the knees, so to speak, by our by the uh, state government? Would that be the governor? Yeah, Governor Kitzhaber. Carol has um, Governor Kitzhaber's phone number right here. All right. So <laughs> this is the governor's phone number, uh, 503. I don't know if we got a graphic person there that can write this down. 503-378-4582. So that's 503-378-4582. And, uh, you know, if you're for this, call them up and tell them you're for it. But I would think that uh, we need to protect the environment. We need to quit encouraging uh, an escalation of the use of fossil fuels, whether it's a liquefied natural gas or whether it's coal, uh, any, any type of uh, uh, 
what did uh, Tom Hartman call it? Ancient sunlight, you know? Right. It's, a, it's a very well put. And uh, let's leave that where it is. It, it had its chance to shine. We don't, need, we don't need to drag it up and poison our atmosphere with it. But um, speaking of uh, poisoning the atmosphere and, and, and the pollution, we're down to less than 10 minutes here. And Carol, right. you have a little story to tell. You were living in West Virginia. You were living in, yeah. in one of those areas where they were knocking the tops off the mountains. Well, we were about two hours away, but uh, on our property, we moved to West Virginia in 1985, uh, back to the land and all that. We oh, had yeah. four, 40 acres, and um, there was a strip mine. Our first exposure to coal in West Virginia was a strip mine on our property that was about a mile long, not all ours, but the whole thing. An existing strip mine yeah. when you moved well, there. Well, it, it, it had been abandoned in the 60s, and abandoned is the word I'd like you to know, because they'll abandon things here, too. Uh, they just walked away, and they left rotted machinery, rusted machinery. They had stripped out a whole section of the mountain, you know, and then they, uh, that, when they, just the let water, it they just left. And so the water on that side of the hollow was poisonous mm -hmm. forever and, and probably always will be. But that was our first. Then in maybe about 96, they started blowing the tops off the mountains in strong way, mountaintop removal mining. And we got involved in, you know, going to see that. We've been to many, many mountaintop removal mines, but we've seen coal up close from the mining, which is done illegally, um, continual uh, violations. Uh, I just had one quick little anecdote to tell you about the mining part of it and, and how callous the coal companies are. Yesterday was the second year anniversary of a major coal mining accident in West Virginia at Upper Big Branch where 20 mine, 29 miners were, were killed. And uh, they sealed it yesterday. They sealed the mine. They had candles and they had prayers and they had all kinds of politicians and ceremonies. And I read the article about it. And at the very end of the article, it says, uh, talking about why this accident happened, the company failed to conduct adequate inspections intimidated workers to prevent them from reporting violations, tipped off crews to surprise inspectors, the report found. The state investigation found that the mine lacked adequate ventilation, water sprays on equipment were not properly maintained and failed to function. The mining company didn't meet federal and state safety standards. For the application of rock dust, a crucial tool in keeping the high, highly volatile coal dust from exploding. 29 men died. Everybody cried yesterday. They didn't have to cry. They could have done what they should have done. And they'll, they'll be the same way here. They are a, a money-making bunch that really is soulless. They have blown up the Sierra Club magazine this month. Just happens to have an article on another part that we've seen of the mining, and that's the mountaintop remo removal mining, mm -hmm. where they blow everything up, all the animals, and they call the top of the mountain, they call the mountain overburden. And they push this. Which means the mountain is the waste. The mountain is the waste, and the animals on the mountain. And they push this whole thing down into the creeks below where people's drinking water is. They, you can't eat fish out of any stream in West Virginia now except for I think it's one meal a month and that's four ounces. Mm. Now because that used to be a source of protein because of selenium, yeah, selenium mostly from the mines and mercury. Um, we've also seen the transportation of coal and I've, I've shown you the picture. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what's gonna go through the Columbia River and is gonna go through Portland with coal, filthy, filthy, greasy coal all over everything, oh, killing plants. There's no effort to keep this clean, none at all. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But so you left West Virginia hoping to leave behind all of the, all yeah. of the horrors of big coal After in your 26 backyard. years, really, and, and the last 15, you know, really fighting this because it's so wrong, we just really threw it up and decided we investigated what states were going in the right direction. And Oregon was number one. So we'd sold our farm and we moved here in January 2011. Mm -hmm. And um, about the time this stuff started kicking off. Right. Then. Well, we didn't know anything mm -hmm. about it. You know, I went almost a whole year and then my birthday this year, we drove up to the St. John's Bridge and we drove through Longview and so beautiful. And I saw a train and I said, I'll never have to see a coal train. Oh, in no. Oregon. Oh, no. Yeah. And well, you it may was not still. two <laughs> weeks later, in January of this year, that I picked up a paper and it said the first one that Klatsk and I had confirmed yeah. that they wanted this. And that's when I got involved with Sierra Club mm -hmm. again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're getting back to Sierra Club. We got a little, <laughs> little under three and a half minutes. Uh, have we covered all the points you wanted to cover? Because we do want to talk, mention real briefly the uh, rally that's going on Monday. Yeah, I'd love to mention how viewers can get involved if they'd like sure. to. Sure, that's the final touch here. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, well, so there's a there's a task for the Sierra Club Beyond Coal Task Force here in Portland that's that Carol is a member of. That is a group and of. We got some some um, graphic up there there we go um, it's a do you want to do you want to say quickly what that is it, well, the, okay <laughs> okay <laughs> the Sierra Club Beyond Cold Task Force meets monthly every fourth Tuesday of the month at the Sierra Club office over at East Burnside and, and 18th um, and they can email me um, uh, Laura dot Stevens at Sierra Club dot org or give me a call yeah. 503-238-0442 um, to ask about, to, to, to get involved with that task force. So it's a, it's a group of concerned activists and citizens. Um, and um, upcoming this Monday, we are getting together in Salem to tell, you know, to call on Governor Kitzhaber to reject coal in Oregon. Um, so this is especially with a two-month timeline for the state to make a decision on whether they're going to barge dirty coal down the Columbia River. They would need to hear it from mm -hmm. their constituents. Governor Kitzhaber needs to hear from people across the state saying, no, we're not going to have, we're not going to let, you, you know, we're not going to let big coal turn Oregon into a coal state. We're not going to let it happen. Governor Kitzhaber, we can do better than dirty coal. Mm -hmm. These are hurt better than this. We and can. we're promised better than this. We're promised better than this. And we, we've done such a good job leading the nation towards, a, you know, building up a clean energy economy. We can do better than this. Mm -hmm. So uh, the rally is in Salem this Monday at 9 o'clock um, at the Department of State Lands building. Uh, it's at 775 uh, Summer Street. Right, it's it's the main street that mm -hmm. goes south through Salem. That at the far end of it is the is the uh, Capitol building. Yep. So that main street that goes down that Sumner is, it goes down uh, yep. uh, to to the uh, Capitol building. It's right along there. Yep. Yep. Um, so 775 Summer Street, Department of State Lands building at nine o'clock, and um, it's uh, we'd love to have everyone there and. Uh, and uh, we'll be leave meeting at the Sierra Club office at 7.30 in the morning to drive down to Salem together. All right. So, yeah. So people yeah. need to get up early Monday morning. Yeah, if they're, they're not go. going to work, you know, get up early in order to, uh, to, to take a swing and, and get the governor on board with this because this is horrendous. We, we've, we've only got 30, 30 seconds left. You've heard the horror story from Carol. Uh, it was a different type of coal uh, Travesty, but uh, there's another one heading heading down to this state as well, and, and we need to we need to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I want to thank both of you for coming on and talking about this. This, this is a, a very educational. People need to know about it. I want to thank the crew. They've done a great job. You know, bouncing back and forth between these two segments. Sometimes it gets pretty difficult, but. Uh, it was important to bring these two messages out and uh, a little a little uh, thing for people to think about how these two different segments were connected because they really are. So we'll, we'll see you next week.